song we sing a lot of times is still bright. You know that amazing what praising can do? If we'll do that more, it'll be a lot better in our life. It's amazing what praising We got a new song we're going to try and teach you tonight. It's on page 244 in your red book. There's five verses to it. I got it 244. You might need a book because you might not know this song. If you don't know it, this is how it goes.
Brother Huey, how about Otis in prayer tonight, okay? Y'all may be seated. Hey, what we're going to do tonight before we do anything else, I, I'm trying to teach you this song that we're going to start singing on Sunday morning. I didn't tell the preacher this, but it's okay. He don't care. <clears throat> so we're going to sing it for you, and uh, hopefully we'll have it on the board in a couple of weeks once I get my computer person back there in the back. That would be Connie or Keith. So it's called We Bow Down. I think I like it. Uh, do y'all like it? Did y'all like it this morning? Y'all did? Okay, well, the preacher liked it, so that's all that matters. <laughs> hey, y'all got y'all ready? We're going to sing the whole thing, okay? All right, and this is what we're going to sing on Sunday mornings. I think, if I can get the computer working, all right. Y'all come on down, guys. While we're coming down, I guess the guys, are we going to do the money thing? We are? We're going to do the money thing. Why don't we get the guys to come on down and do the money thing? Okay.
Hey, Brother Gene, how about praying for us tonight? Thank you. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, Father, we thank you. Just for the privilege of you allowing us to be gathered here again tonight to hear from your precious word. Father, just one thing place this morning. Oh, Father, thank you so much for the souls that were saved, for the lives that you were saved. I want Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life, and I will serve him. Father, these tapes that are made over Washington, Father, you tell us your word will not return unto you for Amen. And oh, Father, I pray that even the one chosen now to hear this message that was delivered this morning from your word, Father, that he would use this to go into Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's in his precious name we pray. How's that? Okay. All right. <laughs> Again, the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, is where we'll be tonight as we continue our uh, New Testament chronological study. And we got down to verse 17, actually, uh, last, the last time we were here, last Wednesday. And we're actually going to back up to verse 16 in order to get the continuity of the thought. Remember, this is that walking in the Holy of Holies where we are actually taking a, have already walked, if you will, typically as a Bible type. We've walked by the brazen labor, which in the Old Testament was the place where the sacrifice was accepted. New Testament, a place called Calvary. We walked past the brazen labor, which is a place where personal cleansing for the priest there's not one of those in heaven because Jesus doesn't need personal cleansing. He was not a sinner. But then he went to the first veil of the tent, and the high priest pulled back that veil and walked inside with a golden candelabra and, of course, the show, showbread, the table of showbread and the altar of incense. This is a place of daily walking where we walk with our Lord Jesus. But then... There was a place that only the high priest could enter in, and that was the Holy of Holies, where, in essence, the eternal redemption was purchased by the blood of Christ. In the Old Testament, it was the purchase of one more year. If, if the sacrifice was acceptable, if it was perfect without spot or blemish, the lamb, and then God accepted the sacrifice and allowed the high priest to walk back out and let the people know that there was a removal or a covering of sins 
for another year. Our Lord, when He placed His blood, He was the offering and the high priest. This is an amazing thing. When He placed His blood, the high priest placed His blood. You get it? And He was doing both the work of the high priest and He was also the offering because He was the only one qualified to offer a sin covering that would never, ever not be covered, the sins of the believer. So tonight, all through the Scriptures last Wednesday night, we kept hearing over and over that He has obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I I want you to get this because I had such a battle with it in, in my early Christian life, having very little church life of what I did was Arminian in theology. In other words, it was those that taught that you could fall from grace and, and be reinstated. You know, you could get lost and have to get saved again. And uh, I, that's what I was taught when I what little I knew. And then I ran across all these scriptures. You know, it's amazing how the Word of God should be able to change your way of thinking. And if it doesn't, you've got a real problem because you're going to believe what you believe no matter what God says. So there's no need in God trying to change your mind, right? Wow, what a terrible shape that would be. But what we are absolutely fond of is when we walk back in the Holy of Holies like we already have in chapter 10, we're now in the presence of God. We're going to be looking at that in chapter 10, verse 16, where we'll start. For the Bible said in this speaking now, God speaking uh, in the Old Testament, and He's reminding us here in the New, He said, this is what the Holy Ghost is a witness to us for. In verse 16, He says, this is the covenant that I will make with them, speaking of Israel, and also, of course, with you and I, with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws not on a tablet, but into their hearts. And in their what? Their minds will I write them. Now, I want you to get this. If you're a believer, you have the law of God written in your heart and in your mind. Think about that. You have, and John said it so beautifully when he said, You need not that I write unto you, because you know all things. I used to read that and think, I I don't know everything. And then I realized he was telling me that everything that God had ever said about law was writ or, or grace, either one was written in my heart and in my mind. I just had to recognize it was there and allow the Holy Spirit to bear witness of it and accept that it's truth and it's there. How many times have you realized when you were studying the Word of God all of a sudden that you've been wrong about something? And by the way, if you're not really ready to admit you're wrong when you're reading the Word of God, you've got a real problem. You've got a real problem. And your problem is with God, not with anyone else that's teaching the truth. It's with God. So He's reminding us, my law is inside of you. And so he says in verse 18, verse 17, And because I've written my law in their hearts and in their minds, that literally is I'm inside of them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. What a blessing that thought is, is that, is that the removal of sin also God chose to forget them. And this is one thing that's so difficult because sometimes we'll come to God and we'll ask God for forgiveness for something we've done. And then we'll go back in two or three days and say, Lord, you know that sin I was asking you about. Please make sure. I want to make sure it's been forgiven. Well, listen to me. If God forgives it, it's forgotten. Amen. It's under the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's over with. And what you need to do is learn to forgive yourself. It goes, God has already forgiven. By the way, you know people that don't forgive themselves, I want to give you something you actually are playing like you're bigger than God. If He's willing to forgive you your sin, and that's who His sin is against, why wouldn't you? Something to think about, huh? So He said, there's now no more offering. Verse 18, He says, now where remission of these is, in other words, where they've been forgiven, there is no more offering for sin. And by the way, there never will be. Jesus Christ was the only offering that God would ever accept for sin. And ladies and gentlemen, He doesn't have to do it but once. And He's already done it once. And that offering is all that you're going to get. It's not there. God will not change His entrance demands into His kingdom. And He'll never change His His uh, desire to live in you. But He will only live in you if your sins have been forgiven. And he lives in you as your sins are forgiven. So he made this play. Now, these these sins have been not just covered, 
They've been remitted. They've been removed. They are now, as far as the east is from the west, they're hidden behind God's back. And the Bible said in verse 19, Having therefore, brethren, boldness. Now, boy, this, this thing is just really, that word is never considered, never should be considered presumptuously. In other words, when he said, Having therefore, brethren, boldness, this means confidence. Not confidence in us. But confidence that we now, since our sins have been forgiven, we have the right, get a hold of this, we have the right to walk into the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could go. Why? Because the veil is no longer there. It's been ripped from top to bottom, as you well remember in the New Testament, the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. Now there is absolutely no blind between the believer and... And the Father, we have absolute confidence that God will receive us because we've received Him. And so He makes it plain, and don't forget this, I don't believe we ever should take this thing for granted, that God's open door policy, if you will, to everyone that is His, is not based on the fact that it doesn't matter what you do. No, ma'am, it does matter. No, sir, it does matter what you do. But it never will keep you from coming to Him as long as you come with a repentant heart. Now, you're not going to bounce in before God and say, Oh, I know I've done all this stuff, God, but I, I know me and you are buddies. No, God's not your buddy. He's your God. There's a difference. Amen? And you come with a broken heart over the sin. You know how I, I just really thought about this. How long has it been since God really broke your heart over your sin? Over your personal sin? It's something that most people act like it doesn't even matter anymore. There's years ago, and I don't, I don't believe in emotional altar calls as such, just, just to get people to do something to, I believe sometimes people will come to an altar and they'll actually weep away their conviction and leave with no confession whatsoever. And I want to say something to you, unless you agree with God that your sin is what he said it is, you'll never receive forgiveness for it. So that's what First John 1, 9 says, if we confess, if we agree with God what our sin is, you say, God, I've committed whatever your sin is against you, and it's against you. And Father, I ask for grace to repent of this sin. And by the way, repentance is an absolute must in order for forgiveness to come, because that's what confession brings. Confession says, God, I'm guilty. Please forgive me. And ladies and gentlemen, to think that God doesn't see our sin once we've been saved as far as the sins we commit, and we don't have to deal with God about them. Yes, we do. That's why he made it plain that we are to confess our sins before God, and he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So verse 10 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Remember, the only thing that gives you and I entrance into the holy is the blood of jesus my goodness alive oh you can't come there on your goodness you can't come there on your riches you can't come there except but one way and that's because the blood of jesus cleanses you so that you are absolutely perfect when you stand before god now don't that blow your little mind remember what he said in hebrews ten fourteen: you have been perfected forever in your spirit man your spirit man gives you the right to come before your god and to have fellowship not only fellowship but also i uh, also have this wonderful thing called forgiveness of our sins so he continued when he said this and by a new and living way let's read all of verse 19 again having though therefore brethren boldness confidence to enter into the holiest and that that must have just sounded unreal to the jew to think that now they had the right to go where only the high priest could ever go only the man who held the highest office could ever go back where now they've been told you have a right if you have faith in the blood of jesus christ you can come back into the holy of holies hey man that just just about blows your mind, doesn't it? And I'm sure it did them. And he says, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us. And here's what it is. Through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. His flesh was the veil that stood between God and man. Simply said, he is the one that opened the veil because the flesh of mankind was a symbol of sin. Not the flesh itself, the desires of the flesh. But what Jesus did, he offered his flesh so that we could now come back, and his flesh was perfect in every sense. Remember, he kept every law. He never offended one. And so now, by the 
perfectness of his flesh, we can walk in before God and have fellowship with God and worship God. Uh, let me let me say first, you can't have fellowship with God unless you're worshiping God. You get it? God isn't someone just to be fellowship with he's someone to worship he's someone to he's the only one who deserves praise and who deserves worship and he said in having a high priest over the house of god do this let us draw near with a true heart near to what near to our god he's talking about coming to the holies now he says when you're going to walk boldly or come boldly into the throne of god do it with a true heart, or a clean heart, if you will, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, he's using the water of separation in the Old Testament where the, the believer had to be in the, and all the priests had to be sprinkled uh, with, with what they called separation water, just like the, the usually was uh, was was in inside that water was the ashes of the red heifer that had been burned and it was made to separate and by the way hear me carefully god is expecting a separated people people who are separated from the world remember the 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 plea that paul said when he said come out from among them and be ye separate say of the lord and i will receive you and be a father unto you he he intends for you and i to be different from the world amen now, I know people say, well, I don't like being different. Well, you ought not have got saved because you are. You are different. You have different taste. You have, I hope, and I, someone once said, one of the main things that I can tell that God made a difference in his life, he changed my want-tos. Amen. It changed yours. You still want to do some of the things you always did. Then one of the two things is going on. You maybe either have never been saved or you still need to grow a great deal to get away from where you were. And by the way, I'll tell you something, I still aren't there. I'm still growing, amen? And uh, I think we all are. If you, if you arrive, please don't let me get near you. I'll contaminate you. How's that? And he said, not only should we come with our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Think about that. A conscience that's made evil is a, is a, is a conscience who is, who's been infiltrated by sin. And he said, that needs to be cleared up before you draw near God. Listen to me. I hope you don't miss this. God will not fellowship with someone who is wrapped up in sin. He will not. He, you are his child. But I promise you, there is no pure fe- God wants to fellowship. How many of you know when you have children and you're, you're kind of on the, on the outs with one of them, you've got a disobedient child? Are you and that child as happy together uh, as you are when that child is obedient? Well, certainly not. And so is it with God. God is expecting us to be obedient. So our content needs to be, and I wish that I could say this in such a way that you'd get it. Do not let sin stay in your life overnight. In fact, I know people say, well, I pray overnight. God will forgive all my sins. That won't get it. Why won't it get it? Because the Bible says that we need to confess our sins. And that means when you sin that sin, and the Holy Spirit convicts you. In fact, He's convicted you of it before you do it. But then when you sin that sin, you need to ask, to ask God to forgive you right then. Repent of that sin and get that out. You know what? All it takes is, 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 let's just give you an example. Let's suppose you've got sin hid between you and God. And you're just not willing to confess it yet because you're not willing to forsake it yet. And all of a sudden, you need to get a hold of God over some emergency thing with prayer. And now you've got something stuck between you and God, and your pure fellowship has been broken. And you're going to have to get God when you come before God. God's going to deal with you about that personal sin. It has to be it has to be moved and gotten out of the way so your fellowship is pure. That doesn't mean God won't hear you, but don't you understand the analogy I'm making? Don't let stuff get between you and God. Get it out of the way. What are you doing? Hanging on the side? You take your little pet sins and pet them. That's why they're called pet sins. We just kind of pet them. We don't want to give them up, right? This is mine. It's not yours. You've been bought with a price and it's sin against God. Get rid of it. Amen. Whatever it is. I know some may be saying, well, uh, that's my own personal sin. There's no such thing as personal sin. Your sin is between you and God. That's more than personal. So, got to get rid of it. Amen. So, he says, let us hold fast. 
the profession of our faith. Holding fast, that means be, be consistent with your profession of your faith without wavering. Why? Because His faithfulness is because He promised. And by the way, how many of you have promised God things you weren't going to ever do again? Did you stand up to your end of the bargain? Uh, most of the time we get all trouble. Let me say something to you. God's not looking for promises because you know this. God knows everything. When you come to God and say, oh, God, I'm not going to do that anymore. God sees tomorrow. God sees the next day. So usually I, I would encourage you to hold fast your faith even when you confess. Confess your sins with the faith that I mean what I say by God's grace. Now, let me say that your willpower won't work. It takes God power to work. And it will work as long as you believe that God can give you. How many believe, how many have quoted this? Some people have this verse for a life verse and never use it. I can do all things through Christ. Really? Well, why don't you practice that verse? All you got to do is say, well, I, I, if I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, then I can be faithful to God because Christ strengthens me. Amen. The, the world has told us, well, everybody's going to sin. Let's get up in the morning and go get ours over with. No, don't do that. Uh, no, we, we aren't sinless, but we ought to sin less. Amen. And we ought to be, be so, sin ought to bother us so bad that we ought not to be able to sleep too good when we go to bed with sin in our life. You say, preacher, do you pray that for me and you? Me and you? Absolutely. That God won't let me. How many times has God ever woken you up during the night and said, something between me and you? Something's between me and you. And then all you got to do is just slip out of the bed. Yeah, get out of the bed. Get on your knees before God. Why? I don't have to do that for God to forgive me. No, but it'll sure make you more careful about sinning next time. When you've got to slip out of that bed, especially if it's cold on the floor. And he said, for he is faithful that promised. And this is God's lettuce patch. You see these let us, let us. Verse 14, he said, and let us consider one another. Boy, look at this. He just got through talking about confessing sins. And now he talks about considering each other. How considerate are you of your brother and sister in Christ? You know, I, some of the most selfish people in the world are Christians. Mine, mine, ours. I, we ought to get all those personal pronouns out of our life pretty well. Because I want to say something to you. You and I as believers don't own anything. It's all on loan from heaven to us. And if we use it right, it'll bring glory to him. If we don't, there may be a good possibility he decides that we're not worthy to keep it, so he puts it somewhere else. So he's reminding us, let us consider one another, it's a beautiful word, to provoke. We do a lot of that. We Provocation, but wait a minute. Let's get it in the right perspective. He says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Wow. The word provoke means to incite. It's like inciting a riot. Let's have a riot of teaching each other how to love and do good works for Jesus Christ. Amen. Wouldn't that be? How many of you love to encourage people? How many of you like to be encouraged? How many of you don't want to hold your hands up for nothing? Okay, I got most of you there. But I love to be encouraged. Amen. I like to encourage others because you know what? I got to say something to you. I'm convinced that there's times in our lives if we don't receive encouragement, we can get very, very low. And that's a bad place to be for a believer because then you begin to think, oh, the enemy really loves that. Because if he's got you at a low place, he'll push your head underwater sure as a world. And he'll have you blue, 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 thinking you're drowning. And you will. That's why Paul said this is so important. When you hold fast the profession of your faith, and then you take that profession of your faith, walking in love, and then you provoke others. You provoke others more by what, how you live than how you talk. It's like the old, you know, your, your profession of your own Christian life. It should be one of the greatest examples. I, but today, I've even, I even know Christians saying, well, they think they're better than anybody else. Well, they, you may think that because they're better than you. I mean, what, I'm talking about living one's life. 
I've even heard people call them Christians that walk close to God, Miss Goody Two Shoes. Well, listen, wear that label well. That ought to be a that ought to be a pride. You ought to be proud that somebody thinks you walks close to God. Most people mean it as a criticism, but I remember the first time some <laughs> when I was teaching in school earlier. Uh, we teachers are able to read students' report and write their reports that parents don't get to see these things. And one of the one of my daughters, one of my daughter's teachers, wrote in there that, well, their dad is home now and he's become a religious fanatic. I thought, hallelujah. <laughs> you know what that means? It means a fanatic is somebody who's all out for one thing. Wouldn't you like to be called a religious fanatic? Or a Jesus fanatic. Let's don't get the religion out of it. But that's what she meant. And he said we need to provoke into love and good works, not forsaking. Now hold on to this. Because you that are in the church tonight don't need to hear this tonight. But the next time you decide to play AWOL, you might want to remember it. Not forsaking the assembling. The word assembling comes from the word ecclesia. And the word ecclesia is normally translated in the Bible, church. So let me transliterate it for you. He says, let us not forsake the churching of ourselves. Assembly, churching. Why? Because he just told you, we need to provoke each other to love and good works. That's what we're here for. And then he continues to say, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting, earnestly urging, and earnestly encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The closer it gets to the coming of the Lord, the more the church is going to need encouraging. You know why? Every demon of hell has been set loose from the church and this age. He's doing everything he can. He can't get our soul. So here's what he wants. He wants to win your ability to have a testimony for Jesus Christ so that other people may not be saved by your life and your witness. That's his joy. Take away that joy. Well, they don't act like Christians. They don't live like Christians. They don't love like Christians. They don't consider one another. And the truth is, sometimes we sure give them a lot of ammunition. Amen? So he said, for if we sin willfully, now here down begins to be difficult translations because I, I'm going to be disagreeing with some of the authorities. Uh, I, I see things different. And I've gone back and read this through in the, in the, in the Greek, and I've, I can't come up with one solution. So if I'm wrong, just God will have to help me with it, and you'll have to get over it one way or the other. And because these verses now come into, come into play, play on words, and I want you to hold on to the idea. Remember, he has just said, we need to be there to encourage one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Then he makes this statement right on the heels of that. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now, we know that there's no more sacrifice for sins. Amen? That's already been settled. Jesus Christ was dying once. He ascended to the throne, and he sat down. And he's talking here. It seems to me that there's two, two possibilities in there. If you, if you both. He said, if we have received the not... What did I say? It's so funny. I get to talking too fast. I hope people online understood. They didn't. They're not going to know this is the difference. Okay. Well, at least somebody's listening. I know that. So let me give you the possibility, two possibilities so that uh, you can make up your mind. I, mine's made up, but I'll let you make up yours. And he said, for if we, it seems to me that the author is including himself, the we, if we as believers sin willfully uh, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now, we realize that if we sin, that we can't out sin our salvation, but we do know we can out, we can bring ourselves into reproach with the Lord, and the fellowship of Jesus Christ can be broken with us. And then he says, here's what we look for, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation 
that shall devour the adversaries. Now, some say that he's speaking here of those who have had the knowledge of Jesus Christ but have never trusted him as Lord. And I can understand where they get that. But if you keep that, keep that idea through this whole bottom text, you're going to run into difficulties in just a few minutes, and I'll show you. Uh, just stay with it. Either, either way, you look at it either way, if they're lost or saved. And then when we get to a couple of verses down, I'll show you why I feel the way I do. And he says, so if, if we sin willfully, if we sin disobediently, open and minded. And by the way, as I said before, yeah, the only way that you can sin is willfully. Understand that? So that means you don't go out and, oh, I did, that was an accident. I didn't mean to do that. Sure you did. So he says, here's what happens when you do that. You have that judgment that you're looking for, and, it's, and it has this kind of judgment. And we talk about fiery indignation. Usually it speaks of the latter thing of those who have never trusted Christ. But in verse 28, he said, now he that despised, he uses an example, he that despised Moses' laws died without mercy under two or three witnesses. They despised the law. God had them killed under two or three witnesses. Of how much more sore punishment, suppose ye that he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherein he was sanctified, he was set apart, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now, he says, we're talking about those who have been set apart. So again, it leads me to believe that he's talking about saved people. And the Bible says then in verse 30, he uses the we again. In verse 34, we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, now hold on to this, the Lord will judge who? Wow, that kind of put the icing on the cake for me. I believe God's talking about how how distinct and how how God sees sin in believers' lives. He's not talking about, I don't believe, annihilation. I don't believe he's talking about removing us from, from his family. I do believe, however, that God is, God is doing something here that we need to know. I believe God's giving us the idea of how he looks at sin in the believer's life. Now, look at this. Talking about the joy that, I know he's quoting Deuteronomy, I think chapter 36, 30, 30, somewhere in there, 38, somewhere in the 30s. But he says, now look at this, the Lord shall judge his people. Look at verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Now, I believe this is written to Christians. I believe that we and I, you and I have, we and I, you and I have the, have the distinct ability to know right from wrong. We've been given the Spirit of God, and when we walk willfully away from God, I have a feeling that it's a very, very fearful thing. Do we make light of sin like that? Is sin, do you realize that what held Jesus to the cross was His, God's desire to have terrible sin paid for, and He did it by His Son? I don't think God looks at sin as a light thing. Do y'all? Are y'all out there? Well, I, I just have this idea that we need to understand that it is when we sin before, when we sin against God, uh, then it's not a light thing. And I don't believe God looks at it as light thing. Yes, He said He'd forgive us, and He's willing to. But it, but if we sin willfully, and we walk away from God and just keep walking, like we don't have any intention of repenting of this thing, i, I got to tell you, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Amen? Now, I don't want to make more of this than it is. You might, and, uh, and some, a man that I admire greatly disagrees with me, but I, John MacArthur can be wrong too. And so can I. And I may be wrong here. If I am, it's okay. I'll tell you what, I'd rather be wrong and not give Christians the idea they can play with sin. And I, don't, I would never, ever use Scripture to try to force something into anybody. You make your decision about it. But it seems to me it's pretty open. His people, he's going to judge. Amen? Now, he says, But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were eliminated, or illuminated, excuse me, Almost eliminated. <laughs> wow, it's been one of those nights with words with me. But call to remembrance the former days in which after 
You were illuminated or had the ability to see. You endured a great fight of afflictions. And he was writing to remind those that whenever they came into the family of God, boy, the war broke out. And every kind of thing, hindrance and difficulties began to occur. You remember the nation of Israel, uh, they were in bondage, but when God brought them out under the blood of the Lamb, it looked like smooth sailing from there to the promised land. Amen. They crossed the Red Sea, went over under the blood. By the way, everyone that came out of, out of Egypt was not, was not an Israelite. As the Paul made sure of that. And not everyone that claims the blood of Jesus is a Christian either. And so he's, he reminds them that all of a sudden they got into the wilderness, and the reason they got into trouble in the wilderness, they didn't believe God, and they went to going by their own logic. You remember he sent out 12 spies, and 10 came back and said, Hell, man, we can't, we can't win this battle. And God said there's only two that made, made the right decision and held to their faith, and that was Caleb, as you well know, and Joshua. And the Bible said that those ten bore witness that we just couldn't overtake that land. They weren't willing to believe God. And for the next 40 years, God let them wander in the wilderness and eat manna, finally giving them manna from heaven. And even in the, in the, in the, when they, listen, here, it's a long ways from salvation to heaven when you live it in rebellion. A long ways. And as it was with Egypt. Or, excuse with Israel. Wow. I preached too hard this morning. I'm give out, I reckon, tonight. So we'll get through it. We're almost there. Hold on with me. So he said, verse 32, Call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. See, sometimes you catch flight for the people you hang out with. And sometimes, uh, by the way, I think it's good to hang out with Christians. Amen. And by the way, uh, that's something we don't have as much as we ought to have. Let me, let me ask you a question. I, I have encountered people over the last, I don't know, the last several years, it seems like. And it seems like the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the further Christians drift apart. They don't spend any time with... Let me ask you a question. If you don't spend any, any time with Christians, is it because you don't want anybody to know how you live? Well, let me ask you. God already knows how you live. Why are you hiding it from anybody? Pride. See? Oh, both of them probably qualify, but let me encourage you. None of us have it together. None of us got it all together. But together, we can encourage each other, even if we don't have it together. And by the way, if you're coming to my house to find out how sorry I am, you already ought to know me. I've confessed every sin I know to you. And we, we just need to be able to get over ourselves and spend some time with each other. We can strengthen each other, guys. And I need you, and I, I need... You need each other. You need to look around and, and find you. A, I know what you do. You need to look around and find you a, a spiritual buddy. And if they don't like you, make them be your buddy anyway. You know why? they got to love you to go to heaven. And maybe they'll learn to like you. Start hanging out some with, e with each other. I believe it would be good for you. I don't know why I'm going into all this, but it's not costing you anything. I believe it's important. <laughs> In verse 34, getting to the end now, pretty close. For you had compassion of me and my bonds. And I, this is one of the verses, I believe, that, that may well signify it may have been Paul as the author, human author. And took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Here's what he said. It costs you to stand fast with me. And ladies and gentlemen, sometimes it'll cost you to stand fast with other Christians. It will, but I want to say something. It may cost you here, but the benefits there are something else. If you get too close to worldly people, bet your bottom dollar it'll rub off on you instead of you rubbing off on them. Because their desire is for you not to impress your desires on them. So look out. And then he said, verse 35, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath a great recompense of reward, for you have need of what? Patience. You have need of, wow. You have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, 
you might receive the promises. Boy, that doesn't fit in today's society, does it? We're 7-Eleven people. If I do something, God promised me something, I want it right now. Uh, if He promised me patience, I want it right now. You see, we're the, but He says here, when you do the will of God, have patience. Now listen to me carefully. Look at this very carefully. When you have done the will of God, it may be that the will of God hasn't done you yet. You, ha you aren't going to be satisfied with the will of God. Did you get it? You want, you want God to do it on your time clock. Do your, we're, American Christians are so good at trying to get God to do our will. God won't do it our way. He said you need patience. If you trust in the will of God and you've done the will of God, wait, and God's will will be performed in your life. Yet a little while, for yet a little while, he that shall come will come. Wow, and will not tarry. But boy, I want to tell you, I'm like John, the, uh, uh, the beloved on the island of Patmos. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Lord, it hadn't been long uh, that I have actually asked God, Lord, I just really want you to come. I'm sick and tired of dealing with sick and tired. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know what, he, does he ever do you this way? He's like, well, you little sissy, I'm not through with you. What are you trying to do? You're trying to get out of here in a hurry. I know what you're trying to do. And he was right. Amen? I really, and, and listen, I want to tell you what, we, there's nobody in this world ever had it better than American Christians as far as a lie. So he says, so he is coming. Now, the just shall live by what? We talk about faith. But the only time that we feel like we're living by faith is when we don't need it. You don't need faith about money when you've got a, uh, got a bank full or a, all your credit cards are not, not maxed out yet. You don't need faith. You don't need faith for fellowship when you feel like you've got your family around. This problem is there's people in this world that need faith to live by every day. I, I was talking with a, a, a young man in Africa just recently, and, and uh, they eat one meal a day there. And he has faith he, because there was nothing else there, to, no, no guarantees that, that there would even be that one meal a day for he and his family. And, but see, we don't understand that, but that, that's the way they live. And, and they still tell you quickly, I'm trusting God for whatever he gives me. Uh, see, the just shall live by what? But if any man draw back, and by the way, I don't believe this is talking about just faith in things. I think it's talking about faith in God. And he said, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. All of a sudden, our faith has gone downhill. Listen, how can I say this? We all run into valleys. Sometimes the, 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 the Christian life is kind of like a roller coaster. But God doesn't have pleasure in people who are in the valley or on the mountain if they're not trusting God for the mountain or for the valley. Both. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition but of them that believe to the saving of the what? Soul. Faith that stays, that's what, that's a doctrine, that's one verse that promotes the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Simply said, those who are really saved, who've really been given faith by God to trust Him as Lord, is going to trust Him till it's over with. Amen.